what what's dangerous is we have insurance companies wanting to practice medicine. And, and they're doing it by forcing us. So they're doing it by disempowering physicians, making us feel scared of them. Um, because really, if they had been able to successfully prove some sort of fraud that I'd committed, which would have been difficult, um, they, that would have been published in the newspaper. It would have been published you know, probably all across the country because I, I, do, I do have a, a lot of places I write for. And it would have made me look dishonest. It would have made me, um, it would have hurt my reputation. And, and that's what they're leveraging against us. Welcome to the Licensed to Live show, where professionals, doctors, champions, VIPs, attorneys, and those in public office discover strategies that help you restart and gain what is lost when you find yourself accused. If another has doubted your integrity, questioned your credentials, or caused your actions to come under scrutiny, you are in the right place. On the other hand, if you have never felt the knot in the pit of your stomach when legal papers are served, the heartbreak of disappointing your family when the lock clicks shut on handcuffs, or had to appear before a board of review, then be aware, the longer you serve, the more likely you are to find yourself under the microscope of those who judge. Prepare yourself for this uncomfortable possibility. Now, here's your host, Dr. Jarrett Patton. Welcome to episode 51 of Licensed to Live. My name is Dr. Jarrett Patton, and I'm your host for our journey together today and every day you choose to listen to this show. If you or anyone you know has been dissed by healthcare, please invite them to join us along this journey. Simply go to your favorite podcast player and subscribe to License to Live. And while you're there, please rate this episode and give me honest feedback so I make sure I provide you with the most up-to-date information about career and life changes. Today, we will be talking with Dr. Naran Alajba, a fellow pediatrician and a prolific blogger. Today, we will learn a little bit more about Dr. Naran and how an insurance company nearly ruined her professional career. And now a word from our sponsor. Summertime is here. Finally, days at the pool, trips to the beach, and family vacations are getting underway. Typically, this should be a stress-free season. However, if your kids don't behave, summers can be one of the most stressful seasons. If you worry about your child's behavior, I have a solution for you. From the creators of Whose Badass Kids Are Those?, a parent's guide to behavior for children of all ages comes the Who's Badass Kids Are Those online course. This seven-week course is designed to help parents up their game to get their kids in line. You will learn essential parenting secrets, the comprehensive command system, meltdown management solutions, and much more. This self-paced course is designed for the parent who wants to have a better strategy in changing the behavior of their children. Don't have badass kids this summer. Take the Who's Badass Kids online course today. Simply go to NoBadassKids.com to get started. Go to NoBadassKids.com to order your course today before the summer is gone. I first noticed Dr. Narayan from a blog that she wrote for Kevin MD. Her story was so compelling and interesting to me. I had to reach out to her to meet her. But before we get into all of that, I want to welcome Dr. Narayan to the show Thank you for participating on License to Live, Dr. Naran. Thank you for having me. I'm, I'm happy to be here. I always love to get a fellow pediatrician on the line, and I know you practice out in Washington State, correct? I do. Well, tell us a little bit more about your journey into pediatrics and what led you to start your own practice. I'm a third-generation physician, a primary care physician. My grandfather was a family doctor nearby in Tacoma, Washington. And he used to talk and tell stories about home visits and how much he enjoyed taking care of people. And uh, then my father uh, became a pediatrician and uh, he opened his own practice in in this area. He joined a group initially, then he broke off on his own uh, independently in 1986. And I, I started working for him one year later in 1987 when I was uh, nine years old. I sort of was raised in the practice a little bit, answering phones, stamping charts, you know, helping here and there. And then I decided that's what I wanted to do. 
So I um, obviously went to med school and did everything that we needed to do to become pediatricians. And when it came time to decide what I wanted to do with my life, uh, we talked about um, me coming back to my hometown and joining him in practice. And so that's what I did. And, and I've loved it. I've been doing it for 18 years uh, coming up this July. And I, I don't think I could do anything else. And I don't really want to do anything else. So I'm, I'm actually really happy in the practice. I love my patients. And it's many of them are third and fourth or third, second and third generation. Actually, I my dad took care of the grandparents as children. And now I'm getting to take care of basically the grandchildren of people who were taken care of in the practice, um, you know, 47 years ago. Man, so being a doctor was in your blood. Starting at nine years old, you you really didn't have a choice. And for you, you just love what you do. You love taking care of kids, and 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 you'll continue to do that to this very day. Yes, I'll probably continue um, for the rest of my life. My dad uh, saw seventeen patients on his last day in the office, which was about 18 months ago, because he passed away five weeks later, he had a heart attack two days after that last day in clinic. And he was still even in his hospital bed, (laughs) trying to tell me that he wanted to come back to work five days a week. And uh, so I think it's really in our blood. It's just something we we feel called to do. Credentials verified. That that's literally there. And uh, knowing the number of 70 year old, uh, still practicing pediatricians and above that I personally know uh, there's plenty of them out of there. So certainly wishing you a long and happy career. Thank you. But your whole career hasn't been rosy, although you're in love with it and still continue to practice today. Have you ever been dissed in your career? Yeah. So I would say I was uh, disempowered. And I've really turned that around and vowed never to let let myself be disempowered when it comes to serving patients again. Wow. Tell us why you were disempowered. Oh, no. Not another test. We've gotten so busy. And I say we because this was when my father and I were working together before he passed away. Uh, we'd gotten so busy that uh, fitting in flu shots and extra kind of things on the side became difficult in the practice. So we started probably maybe 10 years ago or more um, opening up the first Saturday in October and doing what we called a flu shot clinic. And and what we do is for our own patients, they could come in and either choose to just get a flu shot, meaning they walk in, they don't want to have a visit or talk about anything. We give them a shot and out the door they go. Now in our office, my dad and I give the shots to our own patients. So every kid Basically, I'm the person who's given them the shot, which is a little bit, I know, unusual these days because obviously there's other personnel that give shots, but we, we have low overhead and we really know our families well and we're very hands-on pediatrician. So we opened up that Saturday. Um, I think it was the one 2016 is when they were, um, Regents came after me, the insurance company. And we saw, I want to say maybe 60 patients that day. You know, we work all day long. Um, We have extra staff called in. We have many public health nurses who actually come in and volunteer their time because they get continuing education for that. And so it was, it was valuable to them. They wanted to do it. So it's a real kind of community effort to um, immunize everyone that we can. Well, over the years, parents said, gosh, you know, I get my well child check at that clinic. Well, sure. Why not? Can I do my asthma check at the same time and get all my meds ready for the for the winter? Um, you know, one one child that day actually had a concussion from playing football the night before. So so we sort of grew it a little bit. And I, I'm not going to tell my patients no if they want to come in for a visit. So, you know, we saw a multitude of patients that year and uh, we allowed them to ask questions or have other complaints addressed. And so that's built a little bit differently. And patients know that they weren't complaining about it. And for whatever reason, Regents decided to um, do an audit, which again is fine. They came in, they um, sort of wouldn't even tell us who they wanted to, to have charts on, which is fine. And they scanned all the charts, no problem. And then the audit came back that we were clean. We, we had done exactly what we had said we had done. We billed correctly and on we go. So they sent me a letter, um, maybe a few months later, saying we're no longer allowed to be open on Saturdays to give flu shots. And I thought, well, that's kind of strange. I, it's a free country the last time I checked. And um, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure that you can tell me when I can have business hours. And, and I think their point was they thought maybe it was because it's once a year we're open on a Saturday. 
um, that it's it's one of those unusual bumps um, in a clinic, you know, billing or visit schedule. So, I mean, I can see them being skeptical. And of course, that's why we complied with the audit. So I called the this woman. It's I think her name is Anka Menser Wallace. And I, and I put the, her name in the post because, you know, it, it happened and I have the letter to show it. And I said, uh, would you like me to stop doing Regents patients at the flu shot clinic? I mean, that's fine. We can certainly let people know Regents doesn't want kids to have flu shots in their pediatrician's office. And that's as a policy, something you guys don't want to pay for. Is that what you want? And she said, no, you just can't have a flu shot clinic on Saturdays. And, and I said, well, I don't think you get to make that choice. So we didn't really end the conversation on a happy note. And then she got off the phone and took all the private information of these patients and photocopied it and sent it over to the Medical Quality Assurance Commission and then um, reported me for fraud. Now, I have to stop you right there because sure. already this sounds ridiculous. Now, I know. I know you're out in Washington State. I know it's a populated state. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure that you aren't the only pediatrician that practices within that state that takes that particular insurance as patients. Now, I'm also certain that this isn't 1950s uh, medicine where, well, maybe that would be acceptable. But in current day pediatric practice, having flu shot clinics is essential in vaccinating their kids and getting the maximum amount of kids through your practice, through your office to get them vaccinated. So for many of those who aren't pediatricians and specialists, you have to have additional hours or outside hours in order to vaccinate all of these hundreds and thousands of patients that you need to vaccinate every year for influenza. (laughs) So, So I'm having a very difficult time, especially after they had already given you a clean audit that they're trying to dictate your office hours and telling you that you cannot vaccinate on Saturdays. Well, and I think what really they were doing is not only saying, so, so what they're saying is if I vaccinate like a pharmacy, right? So if every person who walks in my door, I tell them, Oh no, you can't be seen for your concussion. You can only have a flu shot today because that would be a medical visit and a flu shot. That's what they want me to do. They wanted to, they wanted to dictate my care. And I said, to the, I said to her on the phone, I said, listen, if a patient is sick and they say, look, I've had a cough and runny nose or I have allergies or I've had a concussion the night before and I would like to be seen for that. I said, look, I'm not going to turn down my patient. That's my job is to serve them. And I think what they were trying to accuse me of is making up those complaints to um, bill excessively. And what's crazy is, I'm about as transparent as they come. First of all, we don't commit fraud in that manner. Secondly, if a patient doesn't have a complaint and has no questions, why would we bill for a visit? I just don't, I don't think it's worth it to stretch the truth to that extent. And me, and, and again, if every, if 80 or 60 patients came in and they all had the same cough and cold, you know, I could see maybe them saying, well, you might be trying to commit fraud. But, you know, for me in particular, there were nine patients they were looking at. And I think there were nine different complaints And each of the patients was willing to sign statements that they had generated the question, like they had come in and wanted to be seen for these things. Because I spoke with my patients when this was going on. I said, look, here's what's happening. I'm being accused of fraud. And, and, and I, I'm wondering if you're willing to, what what you think about this and if you're willing to kind of say what happened and every single patient, sure doc, you know, let me know. I'll be happy to write a letter and say, my son was playing football the night before. And, um, and that's not something you can really make up. Again, this is standard practice. I mean, oh. yes, if, if you have 100 kids coming into your office, giving the vaccine and send them away, well, that's great. Everybody's healthy. But pediatrics, it usually doesn't work that way, especially in the fall. Once they're back in school, they have colds, they have injuries, they have lots of things. And hey, it makes the most sense as a parent. It makes the most sense as a physician to say, hey, if you have a complaint and something addressed, let's not come back and do that again on Monday. Exactly. Uh, Let's take care of it now and get you on your way and everybody's happy. Exactly. I feel like the efficiency of what we do makes so much sense. And interestingly enough, at that time when we did that um, clinic, children under nine could not be vaccinated by a pharmacist at at like a CVS or a a Walgreens type store. 
And the reason the state, and that state law, that was state law. It's been since up, I think, seven, but at that time it was nine. Half of the patients in the practice couldn't get flu shots done at a pharmacy. They had to come in and have them done. So a lot of parents feel like, well, gosh, if I'm going in, I might as well have a physical. I might as well get my, have an, has, I require, you know, kids that are actively have asthma. I have them come in every six months. So twice a year um, to, to manage their inhalers, see what, how we're doing, were we admitted to the hospital? Do we need steroids throughout the year? You know, all those things we do as pediatricians. So then they'd say, well, gosh, if I already have to come in twice, you know, once in October and once in April, but I just schedule it on the weekend, you do the flu shot clinic. Well, sure. I mean, I guess to me, it just seems like a no brainer. But again, what's dangerous is we have insurance companies wanting to practice medicine and, and they're doing it by forcing us. So they're doing it by disempowering physicians, making us feel scared of them. Um, because really, if they had been able to successfully prove some sort of fraud that I'd committed, which would have been difficult, um, they, that would have been published in the newspaper. It would have been published you know, probably all across the country because I, I, do, I do have a, a lot of places I write for. And it would have made me look dishonest. It would have made me, uh, my re- it would have hurt my reputation. And, and that's what they're leveraging against us. And that's why I say I've learned if the law helps us, I mean, really good lawyers are worth their weight in gold. I, I really have come to appreciate and admire the profession of law for this reason. Um, because once I explained what had gone on to the person who was helping me in a law firm in Seattle, he could not believe what was going on. And it did cost me 8000 to defend but I won and, and the state, the state board of health, the medical quality assurance commission, when they read what had happened, um, you know, voted unanimously, actually, I, I have that on good authority. They voted unanimously that I had not committed any fraud. And so really in the long run, truth won out, but it's this process in between that I think is so disempowering for physicians um, because it's, it's an extra, it's this serious concern hanging over your head and, and our job is hard enough. Absolutely. Absolutely. You you are doing everything that you know how to provide the best care, to do the best thing for all of your patients. And then out of nowhere, you're getting dragged around like like a criminal in the system. And and I know in my own experience, I've you feel kind of guilty, like something is wrong here because everything is turned against you as you're going through these num- these number of systems. And disempowering is a great description of exactly what happens because they want to strike fear in the hearts of people and and even have people not even fight back and just kind of roll over. So I'm so glad that you were able to find an attorney and defend yourself. And for those that missed our episode with Dr. Dina Strawn, We talked about the medical board specifically and things that you can do if you get a letter from the medical board or get caught up in that system. But thankfully, in your case, everybody could see the logic and what was going on. And they said, hey, there's there's nothing going on here. Go about your way. But unfortunately, you had to spend time, hours of heartache and $8,000 $8,000 of your own money that I'm sure nobody paid you back for in order to, get to, to let the truth prevail. You know, what's interesting is it takes, almost, people don't realize how long these medical quality assurance investigations go. Um, <laughs> you know, the letter arrived, I want to say a month after my father died. And first of all, they wanted me to account for what my dad had done like his notes, for example, they wanted to look into those. And I said, you know, you're going to have to go to the, uh, <laughs> to the cemetery and ask him because I, we do our own billing, each of us as the physician. And I said, I, I can't be number one held accountable for that. I can't speak to, you know, what, what his notes are saying. And I mean, his notes were fine, but you know, they were really stretching, um, trying to go uh, after, you know, more patients than I'd even seen. And, and the other part of it is it, it took, a, I want to say, almost a year. It was a, a nine months till I got a letter that um, cleared it. And what's crazy is when the letter arrived, they give you two weeks to answer. And then after you answer, uh, it takes literally more than six months. Like every day you're, you're carrying this pretty scary burden. And my own father went through a very similar ordeal that you know, that's what happened to you. I um, mean, he was a pediatrician as well. And, and the scary part is it was a good part of, I want to say two year, it was a two year process. It was more expensive. It was $55,000. Um, 
And we, we did get that back because we fought in court. We, we sued the insurance company actually for not covering him. My dad was amazing. And, uh, and we won. And then we also won against the state of Washington in a public records violation as well. So we, we were able to kind of get uh, reimbursed, which I, that's not really, you, you can't get the, what you lost, what your heart lost and what your soul lost from what yes. happened, being yes. wrongly accused. But you know what? We have to stand up because if we don't, what's going to happen is we, we lose the ability to, do, to care for our patients, to provide them the care they deserve. And it's going to be decided by people like this auditor at Regents. And what I find so frightening is an auditor who works for an insurance company makes money based on what they can quote unquote prove a doctor did wrong. So in essence, you're incentivizing them to find something about a physician that's either criminal or wrong. And then you're paying them to, to, to smear us. And what's so crazy is that you're, per, you're perversely destroying the system. And, yes. you know, we, we never really get to talk about it. I mean, Kevin, and I understand Kevin MD's perspective when he published, the original article was published on a site called The Deductible, and they let me name the auditor and the regent's company because that's the truth and that's what happened. And understandably, Kevin was a little bit uncomfortable with that, and I don't blame him at all. Um, but many people that commented on his article said, you know, we've followed your blogs for years and you're very transparent. Why, why withhold these, these, this information? And I said, you know, not everybody's empowered enough to go forward with that. And, and I very much respect um, Kevin uh, uh, tremendously. So what I'm saying is because of what I've been through, I feel real comfortable coming out and, and saying what's happening. Because I think if we don't, we run the risk of our, our patients not understanding how hard we fight for them and how fight we f- how hard we fight for ourselves so we can serve them. I literally love my patients. I feel so blessed. The families I have are, I say, I always say I have the best patients in the entire country. I'm very lucky. Um, and, and it's an honor to serve them. And I, the, the chance that I may lose that opportunity from a greedy auditor and a greedy insurance company is really, it's actually terrible. It's terribly frightening. And I, and I'm just, I feel like it's my life's mission to not back down on something like this. Well, and I'm so glad you're telling your story here because more people need to hear about these things. And if you get caught up in an issue with the insurance company or an issue with the medical board or an issue with the quality assurance committee, stand your ground and yep. stand up for yourself and fight. Yep. And it's, find a good lawyer. They're worth their weight in gold. Um, we, I know there's this whole thing about doctors and lawyers, uh, but you know what? Um, I've also fought the Office of Civil Rights on a um, records violation too. And I, and I won that as well. Um, and, and the lawyers really, they're so, especially if they've done this kind of work and there are uh, lawyers out there that have done medical quality assurance work. They defend physicians. Um, they, they're really so, such a valuable resource. And, and I've, I just, again, have tremendous respect for the work they, they do because they were able to help me um, bring the truth to light and then um, be successful and, and win. Absolutely. You must have an advocate there that's willing to fight for you. Although a lot of times these companies and, and bureaucracies will try to lure you in to think that it's an amicable thing or something that can be resolved easily. Nope. They have a team of attorneys on their side in the background yes, working on this stuff. You have to get legal rep- representation uh, because th- there's just no other way to go. It. And, and it's going to cost you some money. It's going to cost you some money up front. But uh, like, like you said, Dr. Nuran, this attorney for you, the attorney for me, they're worth their weight in gold. Absolutely. And even worse, I had a defamation suit recently. It's a little bit similar uh, to what happened with my dad, and I think you as well, where someone accused me of being indifferent to childhood sexual abuse, and the entire thing was fabricated. There was never a child. There was never anything I was informed about. And yet they had sent it out to over um, 800 people by email. Um, It was part of an organization in this community I belonged to. And, and all that information was spread even farther. Well, I found myself another lawyer, <laughs> another <laughs> lawyer who was a defamation expert and, um, in Seattle, and they were phenomenal. Um, but it, but I, it was a heavy bill, 
And um, they were, they were great. They let me kind of, you know, pay a small amount as I went along. And I told them, I, I will pay you as long as I live if, if I need to pay this off and, and um, keep my reputation. And I was reimbursed. The case cost me 200,000 and, um, and I got that back. Wow. Yeah. I mean, and, and they were great. They let me pay a small amount, you know, every month. And then they, not only did I get a court order that said this person completely lied and I had never committed a crime and I had never done anything wrong. Um, and the day that that court order came, it was one page and signed off by a local judge here. I'm looking at this page thinking, I cannot believe I'm such a target that it cost $200,000 to get this one page signed off on. But you know what? They can't come after me again and use this, this fake story against me um, to ruin my reputation or ruin my ability to serve patients and serve children. And so again, I, I don't know why these things are happening to me. I promise I'm a really nice person. <laughs> <laughs> but I think physicians are a target sometimes. And, and it's not even because we've done anything to that particular person, but because either we have a higher profile in the community. I mean, I write for a living on the side. And also people, people don't, there are certain people that, that don't like doctors and they'll take it out on whoever they can. And so I think we really, again, need to know if you're a good person and if you've done the right things and if you've told the truth and, and you've not harmed a child, then it's worth it to honestly mortgage your house if you need to and, and, and win in court because then you can, your life, you never, you're not looking over your shoulder for the rest of your life. And that is a very freeing and empowering feeling. And then the thing is the next time somebody comes after you, you're comfortable if you, again, if you haven't done anything wrong in standing up and fighting. Absolutely. You have the confidence. You have built the experience. Uh, certainly put in a lot of sweat equity uh, and heartache over these things. And, and uh, as far as I'm concerned, you might as well get an honorary law degree from somewhere <laughs> as, as many times as you've, you've gone through different systems uh, to stand up for yourself and fight. I can't say it enough. You must stand up for yourself and fight. Absolutely. And I, and I remember at the beginning of this defamation um, issue, somebody told me, well, nobody ever wins on defamation. You know, it's an unwinnable situation. And I said, well, watch me. And it was so important. You know, if somebody just said I was a terrible doctor, honestly, I can live with that. But when someone sends to 800 people that you committed a crime as a physician in the state of Washington, um, I, that's really dicey. You know, I, I could have walked away, but again, I think I would have been looking over my shoulder for the rest of my life. And so, yeah, I, I feel like I've learned a lot and, um, and I won't be afraid next time. The comeback. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's an experience that you wouldn't want to have to relive again. Oh no, absolutely. You're correct. But you actually get the chance to, build another skill set that you'll be able to use in the future or help advise or guide someone else in the future. Well, and that to me, in all honesty, I was just going to say that. I think that's the most important part of this, that, you know, what you've been through, what I've been through, um, the more we can share those stories with the public um, and especially other physicians who may be experiencing the same thing or um, afraid of that or in the middle of it. Um, if we can empower those positions to stand up and say, you know what? Yeah, you may have to pay a lawyer X number of dollars, but, but this is your career. This is your calling. This is your profession um, that we're talking about. And, and we have to protect it if we can. Um, and I think for me anyway, that's something, I mean, I so appreciate you having me on here because it allows me to tell more people this story. And if I can be a help to anyone else, then it's been worth it. Absolutely. Now, you mentioned about your blogging, and I've seen your blogs in a number of sites. What got you interested in that? Um, yeah, it's funny you ask. I have had all these patient stories over the years that uh, some of them are poignant or teach a lesson or are just memorable for whatever reason, whether they touched me or they touched the family. And people have always said to me, my own patients have said, you know, you need to start writing these down. So I started writing them down. And then that was about three, three years ago or so. And then I started looking around and going through things like this, um, like my fight with the Office of Civil Rights on the medical, medical records um, issue, and even just my frustration with denied prior authorizations for patients who need care. And I started realizing that these stories need to be told so other people can understand from 
what a, the obstacles that a physician faces. And so it sort of morphed into fewer patient stories and more of a medical politics type of approach. You know, and, and there's various MIPS and MACRA and other political um, constructs that were created and, and physicians are being forced to follow, like electronic medical records. And, and during that time, I wrote about how my dad used to put, used to use index cards like physicians did <laughs> historically 50 years ago to, to document patient encounters and how far we've fallen in a way. Um, and, and then things would happen. We'd get a 16 page electronic note. And my dad was sort of, we were chuckling one afternoon and he said, this says no diagnosis. <laughs> <laughs> it's a five-year-old scene in the ER, and after 16 pages, the diagnosis is no diagnosis. He said, this is such a waste of money, of paper, of time, of a physician's expertise. And, and I just started putting those stories down and started writing for Kevin MD and the deductible and the healthcare blog. And actually, I do a bi-monthly column in my local paper, The Kids Have Sun. And, and I was um, the, the number one most read columnist within about six months. And so I've been writing for them for about two years now. And actually, I just had an op-ed published in the Seattle Times. Um, so it's sort of grown, I think. And, and what's fascinating to me is the, the, main, the mainstream media thinks that, that the public is not interested in what doctors have to say. And, and there are certain things I don't think they are worried about listening to doctors. Like if we're going to talk about how hard our job is per se, I, I, like the whining perspective, I don't think Matt, mainstream media is interested in that. But when we're actually not whining, we're saying this is hard because I'm having to not do my best for patients. And when it's told from the, the aspect of um, like, I always say, I'm standing next to my patient fighting the system. You know, I'm not fighting my patient. My patients are great. Um, it's, it's me and my, my patients fighting together. We're fighting the battle together. And when you, when you write from that perspective, patients really, number one, they understand because they're fighting too. And, num and number two, they feel more empowered to fight with you and for you. And, and I think that's the only way we're going to change the system. So really what started as sharing patient stories is, has become me sharing the fight with patients to take back the system and to be able to do what we were trained to do, which is save lives and serve human beings. Advocacy. Yeah. It just doesn't go away. It's, it's a part of what you do. It's a part of what you do professionally with your kids in your office. It's also a part of what you do by spreading a message on a broader platform through your writing, through your blogging, and you're reaching hundreds of thousands of people potentially with, with these things all the time. And, and I know the uh, blog that got my attention on Kevin MD is, is still in, in one of the six months hottest. So I know thousands and thousands and thousands of eyes have, have seen your writing and it helps tell a story. It helps spread a message. And it's all about advocacy. It is. That story, um, when it started out on the deductible, actually, was shared, I want to say, 20,000 times wow. um, within about a week. And then when Kevin picked it up, obviously, it went even farther. And then there have been multiple. One of the patient advocacy groups asked if they could share it on their blog, which, of course, I said, absolutely. Um, <laughs> you know, this is just trying to spread the message that, Physicians need to advocate for patients. Patients need to advocate for physicians and themselves. Um, and, and we can do that together because really everything starts with that sacred relationship, a patient and a physician. That to me is so, so important. It's the most important part, um, more so than being involved with the government, being involved with hospitals, being involved with insurers. It's, it should be me and my patient together against the world. And I think we, we can't lose. We can't lose fighting with, you know, with patients together against that system. Um, and it's, it's going to be the only way back to a decent healthcare um, system in the country. You're right. We have to do this together. Uh, there are a couple of different sides to all of this, but uniting, teaming up and pushing for change is the way to go about it. So I thank you for doing what you are doing in order to change the system. My pleasure. I'm going to keep doing it. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Please do. Dr. Naran, where can people find out more about you? Well, um, I'm an associate editor at The Deductible. So that's the deductible.com. Uh, I write a blog, a pers uh, just a personal blog. Uh, it's Mommy Doc on Facebook. And that's one word, just M-O-M-M-Y-D-O-C. 
And on that Facebook site, there's a, a link to my blog, which is on um, Blogspot. I'm not exactly technologically advanced. So um, that one is uh, www.peds-mommydoc.blogspot. And uh, then I write for the Kitsap Sun. It's a, a USA Today associated paper. And every sun, every other Sunday, I um, have a column that I've been writing for now two years that's pretty well followed. And uh, then I pop up here and there. I'm hoping eventually the New York Times accepts something. Uh, but I'm hoping the Seattle Times accepts a second book time in the next year. So lots of places to find me. And then I, I do write for Kevin MD here and there as well. Well, this is great. And all I can say is keep writing, keep sharing your message and keep doing what you're doing. It's wonderful that you're able to do all of these things on both a micro scale and a macro scale in the face of physicians, in the face of patients. You are fighting for all of us and really telling a lot of stories. So I appreciate you doing that for us today. Is there anything else you would like to say to our audience? No, I was just going to say thank you for um, being as open with your own story, which, um, you know, is horrific. And I appreciate that you've started this podcast to sort of spread the message that uh, there is a way for, for us all to, to fight and stand up for what we believe in. So thank you. Final Judgment. Licensed to Live. Thank you so much. Dr. Naran, for for coming on the show today. You have given us so much to think about. Make sure that you're following her blogs. Make sure you're supporting her at the newspapers. Just and, and I'll have all those links in the show notes so you guys can get there directly because she really has a lot to say and she's really a gifted writer on top of it all. So thank you, Dr. Naran, for coming on Licensed to Live today. Thank you. Remember, Firestarters, if you or anyone you know has been dissed, disengaged, dissatisfied, disgruntled, disenfranchised, or disempowered with healthcare, please invite them to join us along this journey. Simply go to your favorite podcast distributor and subscribe to Licensed to Live. And while you're there, please rate this episode and give me honest feedback. So I make sure I provide you with the most up-to-date information about career challenges and life changes. And as you guys know, I'm always out there hanging around in LinkedIn in between episodes. So make sure you check me out there until our next episode. See you next time. No matter how disheartening the moment of accusation sounds, how deep the pain of immobilization stabs, or how bleak your future looks, no one can take away your license to live. Keep Dr. Jarrett's expertise handy and unlock your future. Go to Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or another podcast player and subscribe right now to Licensed to Live. See you next time.